Obrigado, Leandro. Boa tarde. É um prazer estar aqui em São Carlos novamente. Tem pouco mais de dois anos, a última vez que eu visitei São Carlos, que eu vim aqui pra, também para dar um curso semelhante a esse. E desde então a gente começou essa colaboração com o Alejandro, com o Gustavo, com a Ione, com o Lee, que agora está aposentado. E tem sido um trabalho interessante e promissor. Tem um monte de coisa para ser feita. Bom, no trabalho de hoje, o que eu quero apresentar aqui nesse seminário, é uma, uma revisão do que a gente tem feito em Milheim, até um pouco antes, o que eu, o que eu, o que eu fiz também em, em Viena nos últimos anos. E como vocês veem, eu mudei o título em relação ao que estava no, 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 no cartaz, para ser um pouco mais específico. Eu vou falar do, de, desses aspectos mecanísticos do, da fotoquímica e do, de processos ultra rápidos, principalmente de, uma, de, uma, de um ponto de vista computacional. Bom, antes de qualquer coisa, já me apresentar. Eu estou vindo do Max Planck, uh, do Instituto Max Planck para o Colin Forschung, em Milheim. E se você tiver aí com dúvida o que é o Colin Forschung, Colin Forschung é pesquisa de carvão. Eu quero falar do Max Planck Institute for Colin Forschung, e for, for who doesn't know, Colin Forschung is co-research, pesquisa de carvão, co-research, and Milheim on the Ruhr. That's a small city in uh, East Germany, near Mülheim. By the way, that's the best, uh, the, the best aspect of, 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 of Mülheim, to be near Düsseldorf. That's the city, it's crossed by the Ruhr River. That's, it gets a name from there, Mülheim and the Ruhr. And uphill, you have the Max Planck Institute there. You, see, you can see the building. That's one of the few sunny days that you have every, every year in, in, in Milheim. And it's quite funny to, have, uh, to, have, to, to, to live in a city that you don't really have sunny days, uh, especially because you are doing uh, photochemistry and looking at the effect of the sun on the molecules all the time. So let's start from the beginning. Physical chemistry of excited states and computational simulations. From a very schematic point of view, in a very basic point of view, what you do there is starting with a molecule in a ground state that will be in equilibrium between nuclei and electrons. And then, after the photoexcitation, after absorption of light, this equilibrium is broken and the electronic structure is completely different. The nuclei are still in the same position because uh, they don't react in the same way as the electrons. But then, the nuclei start to relax, to equilibrate the new electronic structure. And there's a feedback between nuclear and electronic systems until you get a new equilibrium. And that's what we want to determine. How this equilibrium is established? How is the relaxation along, uh, in excited states? In a still a schematic, but less obvious way, what you have there is several potential energy surfaces, boron per heim surfaces, for the ground state, the, uh, the orange, uh, orange surface, and for the excited states, like the blue, the green, don't need to have the same multiplicity. If my ground state is singlet, I can have a triplet, like here. And after the photo excitation, that's the instantaneous process, it starts a vibrational relaxation that brings the molecule down through the surfaces, and in every crossing, the molecule can either remain in the same electronic structure, like the green here, or change to another electronic structure, the blue, for example, or the orange again. And we want to determine that. For every one of those processes, crossings and recrossings, you can establish and can compute probabilities. You can propagate the dynamics. For the ultra-fast dynamics, this kind of regions that you have avoided crossings or full crossings, they are especially important. Because in a region like this, uh, you have a large energy gap, and the transition takes several nanoseconds. Or if you have a gap like this, and between different multiplicities, it can even take milliseconds, much longer. But when the molecule reaches a crossing between the surface and a region of a conic intersection, then the crossing can be very, very fast. It can be in a picosecond time scale. 
State the problem, we want to know how can a molecule be electronically excited, and after that, how does this molecule relax and get rid of this excess of electronic energy? We want to know how long does this process take? We want to know which products are formed, and we want to know how does the relaxation affect or is affected by the environment. And we use simulations for that. Theoretical simulations, computational simulations, are necessary to map the electronic states, the ground and excited states, and to model the mechanisms that are taking place in there. The computational simulations, uh, they are also useful to deconvolute the experimental data. As you know, the experimental data from time resolved spectroscopy, or even from, from steady experiments, often came uh, in a very convoluted way with everything in a mass of data. And the, experimental da the computational data helps to decovolute this data to identify intermediates that sometimes are really very elusive, intermediates that disappear in a fraction of picosecond. And the theory can help with that. I'm going to show a few examples like this. In the particular excited state dynamic simulations, uh, can shed light on time-dependent properties like uh, quantum yields or lifetimes. This kind of research you have impact in several different fields, in basic physical chemistry, in uh, biosciences, in technological sciences. You can see a list far from comprehensive, far from exhaustive list of fields that are profiting from uh, simulations and experiments of excited states, photochemistry, and photophysics. In my, uh, in my case, I'm looking most of the time in problems in this region here connected to biosciences, but from a very basic point of view. I've been working in this field for many years, uh, for about 10 years, or a bit more than 10 years. And for all of this time, I've been looking at different problems in basic processes, like uh, what happens to very, very small molecules in the basic process there, in acetylene, acetylene formamide, in protonated shift bases, aromatic rings. I have been looking at energy and materials, looking at photo-induced rotors, phototriggers, and polymers, heterojunctions, problems related to health and environment, environment especially nuclear bases, uh, photoprocess in nuclear bases that I'm going to talk later here today. Also, uh, more particular cases as uh, zeroacanic acid that uh, I'm not going to discuss today, but it's a quite important molecule that causes uh, skin cancer upon UV excitation and porcine that can be used for uh, uh, photodynamics therapy. And together with all those applications, I have been working with methodological development, especially the development of the Newton X program that I'm going to mention later. That's a program for excited state dynamic simulation that I have been developing uh, since 2005. And several methods connected for that, including methods for spectrum simulations. Let me make my point by showing a specific case study that's the dynamics of nuclear bases. If you look at the spectrum of the five nuclear bases composing uh, DNA and RNA, thymine, cytosine, guanine, adenine, and uracil, you see they are uh, chromophores in the UV region. They strongly absorb the UV, UV radiation. And the composition of this spectrum gives the spectrum of the DNA that's also absorbing the UVC and UVB region. You can compare the absorption of the, U, of the DNA in the nuclear bases with the irradiance of the, of the sand, and you see that the, uh, on the Earth's surface, there's not much of overlap. The overlap is basically here in this region near the, the uh, red side of the absorption band. That's quite different from extraterrestrial irradiance, that it's all over the UVC going to a shorter wavelength and higher energies. And the difference between the extraterrestrial and the Earth's surface irradiance is basically uh, the ozone layer that's absorbing all the UV uh, radiation and breaking it down. And that's essential, because if you, didn't if you didn't have this reduction in irradiance, probably our DNA would be uh, 
quite unstable, would be absorbed in the UV radiation and then breaking down just afterwards because of the, all those mutations uh, over there. After excitation, UV excitation, all five nucleobases return to the ground state very fast. They return uh, in one picosecond, adenine in one picosecond, guanine point, less than one picosecond, 0.36 uh, picoseconds, thymine, uracil, and cytosine also in equivalent times. And there's something curious here. Uh, the purine bases, they have a single lifetime, a single time constant coming from the experimental data, why the pyrimidine bases have more than one time constant. So it seems that the, the, it's, more, it's a more complex situation for, for, for the pyrimidine than the purine. And if you look at the fluorescence quantum yield, you see that they don't have any fluorescence, almost any fluorescence. For instance, adenine. For every 10,000 photons absorbed by adenine, only two are, are re-emitted back in the form of fluorescence. All the remaining uh, photons just disappear, are converted to, into thermon, thermal motion. That's the internal conversion process. And the short excited lifetime, together with the low fluorescence quantum yield, is the strong indicator of internal conversion through conic test sections. Remember again, conic test sections are those crossings between surfaces that I mentioned before. A short lifetime can enhance the photostability of a molecule. At least that's what people believe nowadays. And this enhanced photostability happens because uh, the excited state is extremely reactive. And if the molecule goes back to the ground state quickly, it doesn't have time to break down in fragments. You have a photophysical, uh, uh, a photophysical process. This effect might have constituted an evolutionary advantage for having those uh, base, nuclear bases in our DNA. That's something that's still under debate, but it's a quite uh, probable hypothesis. Indeed, there are experimental evidence that purine per, uh, percussors were in, in, uh, in the prebiotic world were photostable themselves, and I'm going to talk, talk about this later. If I take adenine, you have probably you never saw adenine in such strange conformations. You see here, uh, the hydrogen is almost dissociated, and here, the carbon-6 is out of plane, and the amino group is completely displaced out of plane, and here, the carbon-2 is out of plane. All those three geometries characterize conic test sections. They are geometries for which the singlet, this first singlet excited state has exactly the same energy as the ground state. So they are the main conic test section for adenine. From now on, I'm going to represent the conic test sections using those symbols that just enhance uh, the main feature, geometrical feature, causing the intersection, OK? You want to know here which of those conic test sections is the most important for the internal conversion of adenine. I'll tell you later how those calculations are done, but right now what I want to show is one result. I'm going to show a movie, and in this movie we're going to see adenine moving here as a function of time. It's a 200 femtosecond simulation. Adenine will start in excited state. This black dot will move along the surface, indicating the current state every time step. And I will ask you to pay attention to this graph here first. I will run a move twice. Adenine is moving in a first excited state. And at some point, the first excited state, you cross the ground. That's the red state. And now adenine is moving in the ground state. That was the internal conversion process. OK, once more. Almost there. And then I stop the movie. 